My name is Christina McClellan, and I'm a woman at I'm the Iowa. Chief Curator at the University Hi, of I'm Iowa Mary, Museum of Art, and I'm a woman at Iowa. She's Gigi Durham. I'm an associate professor in the School of Journalism, and I'm a woman at Iowa. Welcome. My name is Carissa Haugeberg, and I am your host for today's episode of Women at Iowa, a show that documents the history and experiences of women at the University of Iowa. Today's guest is Joan Lipsky, who served in the Iowa General Assembly from 1966 to 1980. Today we will be discussing her interest in law, gender, and civil rights. Um, welcome. Thank you. Joan Lipsky. Um, First of all, some of our audience may be familiar with your family, if not with your name, because of the Smulikov uh, furniture store. Can you explain your connection to the Smulikov family? Well, my grandfather was an early uh, businessman in Cedar Rapids. He came in the late 1880s and uh, purchased a small furniture store, and the this furniture store is still in existence and still going and has been a family owned and operated uh, business and I think hundreds and hundreds of Iowans from this part of the state have uh, are sleeping on Smulikoff beds and sitting on Smulikoff chairs mm -hmm. and we've had an, a very happy relationship mm -hmm. with furnishing Iowa homes and mm -hmm. so I'm from that family. Okay. And you were born in 1920, which means that many of your formative years occurred during the Great Depression. Can you explain w how that has influenced your life and your perspective on, uh, for example, when you became a state legislator, how, how did the experience of living through the Great Depression inform your view? Well, I think everybody is a creature of their own times. You know, you grow up and what happens to you is what you think is the normal uh, kind of experience, but for those of us who grew up when money was very scarce, fortunately my father was always employed and there was always enough uh, to get by on uh, in my home, but I knew many people, many of my friends, our neighbors, were people who had lost their jobs and they really had little or nothing. And there was a, in those days we made our own fun, we, we got around on our own feet. Mm -hmm. We, uh, people made do. It was just a whole different kind of world. And you never get over that. Mm -hmm. you, you never stop feeling that you ought to save things and you ought to make the most of things. You don't throw things away. That's just part of, mm -hmm. I think anyone who grew up in those days feels that way. Yeah, the sheer devastation of poverty during that period, yeah. You didn't feel poor, okay. you know, because everybody was in the same boat, but w what you were was, uh, you were extremely conservative in the true sense of that word. Mm -hmm. In other words, you just, you made, you didn't, you made the most of everything. If you had something to eat, if you had something out of the garden, you used it, you saved it, you kept it. Mm -hmm. Same with your clothes, same with everything you owned. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that I think is kind of interesting is that you ended up finishing high school in Mississippi. Why did you go away? Well, we had a change of, in um, the schools of, in Cedar Rapids. We had an old high school. My mother and her siblings all graduated from it, and I was going to that high school, and it was condemned. And the Cedar Rapids had to build new high schools, and they didn't have money. It was mm -hmm. a really tough time, and so they decided to expand the junior highs into, into six-year schools. They were, mm -hmm. uh, they were uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, and the high school was 10th, 11th, and 12th in those mm -hmm. days. And so they just put some classrooms onto the old junior, on relatively new junior highs, four junior highs. And I didn't want to go back to that junior high school that I had just come from mm -hmm. the year before. And so my parents were willing to let me choose a school to go to. And I chose Gulf Park in Gulfport, Mississippi, because it was warm. I never did like cold weather. Mm -hmm. And then following graduation, you attended Northwestern University. I went to Northwestern, where it was cold again. Okay. And what did you study at Northwestern? I 
I went to Northwestern initially because of the journalism school, which is outstanding mm -hmm. and still is. But when I got there and saw what some of the classes were going to be, uh, they didn't really appeal to me. I, I knew that what I wanted to do was write, not to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. And so I switched to uh, psychology. I had entered a class in, as a freshman in psychology that was taught by a very dynamic uh, professor, Dr. Morgan, and I was very attracted to that. Mm -hmm. So I majored in psychology. And were your parents supportive of your desire to pursue higher education? My father had to leave school at the end of the eighth grade because of his father had died and he was the oldest of five children. And he went out and went to work. And so he always had felt very deprived because he had not been able to complete his education and he valued it highly. My mother had graduated from high school, but in her day, girls didn't go to college. Her brothers went to the Wharton School, both of them, Mm -hmm. at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, but she and her sister were not uh, given that opportunity. So they both thought that a college education was a very precious thing and they encouraged mm -hmm. me and supported me okay. in my educational efforts. And while you were at Northwestern, is this the period at which you became an intern at the University of Chicago Hospitals? No. Okay. That, uh, after I graduated from Northwestern, I came here to the University of Iowa okay. and uh, in the enrolled in the psychology department as a graduate student at, and was uh, pursuing a master's degree when um, at, sometime just shortly before the end of the sem first semester, uh, a husband and I then my boyfriend decided to get married and he lived in Chicago and so I went back to Chicago and it was then that I went to the University of Chicago okay. uh, hospitals as an intern in psychology. And you were the first person to intern in psychology at yes. the University of Chicago. That's very interesting. Um, and what kind of work did you do at the University of Chicago hospitals? Well, I did a lot of testing of, of children. I worked with children in both, they had two hospitals that dealt with children, one for children who were seriously handicapped, uh, both mentally and physically, and the other, Bob's Roberts uh, Children's Hospital. And I spent, uh, my time was divided between the two, and I did a lot of testing, especially of the children who were handicapped. Mm -hmm. And I did do some therapy with children at Bob's Roberts okay. under the under the um, tutelage of the psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And the, against the backdrop of your life at this time was World War II, which yes. your husband ended up participating in yes. the war effort. Uh, what did he do? He was um, an employee of the uh, Army uh, Signal Corps as a cryptanalyst, mm -hmm. secret codes. Okay. And he and uh, so our life was interrupted, and he went to uh, Arlington, Virginia, where that division was stationed, still is there. It's no longer part of the Signal Corps, but uh, and uh, I, as soon as I was able to terminate my work and uh, dispose of our things, get them in storage, I followed and. Mm -hmm. We lived in Arlington, Virginia throughout through the rest of the war while he worked. And it was after the war then that you moved to Cedar Rapids? Yes. Okay. And one thing that I really appreciated about you the f first time that we ever spoke was that you mentioned that you um, began to raise children and you quit your job and really didn't think much of it, that that was the next step in your life. That That's right. When I, I worked as a psychologist, at I can. I did the a year of internship at the University of Chicago Hospitals, and then I went on staff as a mm -hmm. staff psychologist. When I went to uh, followed my husband to Virginia, I worked for the county of Arlington County mm -hmm. as a consultant in psychology and worked with some of the children that were uh, dependent on the county for assistance. 
and I had a few private patients as a psychologist, and I got pregnant, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, I continued working uh, f while we were there. But when we came back to Cedar Rapids, uh, I again had another child, and uh, it never even occurred to me, you know, to continue to be professionally active. In mm -hmm. those days, we just, if you had children, you stayed home and took care of them. Right, and I think that that's a, such an important thing for our audience mm -hmm. to hear because it sounds like you were doing everything appropriately to have a really successful career, uh, that you'd made all the right moves, you'd gone to very good schools, had appropriate training, and then like that, motherhood changed the dynamic for you. Well, it just interrupted, really. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, I think there still are women who choose to go home and, mm -hmm. and uh, through a certain period of time when they think their children are especially uh, needful of, of parental, direct parental supervision and then return to their careers mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that you ended up becoming involved in um, w as you had children was the school board system. Um, you mentioned that there was a, a bond issue that came up and that it sort of got you energized and interested in local politics. What, what happened? Well, when we first came back uh, to Cedar Rapids, during the war we had made a decision to return to Cedar Rapids. My family had asked my husband to come into our into Smulikovs, and we had determined that we would do that. We thought it was a nice place to raise a family, and of course I was very happy to be home. And uh, the, uh, very early, the, the Cedar Rapids School board decided to have a bond issue because all through the war, you know, there had been no construction of new schools and then meanwhile the baby boom had started. Mm -hmm. So the schools were greatly overcrowded and of course we had a, a child who was going to be one of those students in that school. So it, we were very distressed when the bond issue failed. Mm -hmm. And with that we became very involved in what we could do about it and ultimately we formed, my husband and I were sort of spearheaded the formation of the Cedar Rapids uh, Citizens for Public Education mm -hmm. and which was a citizens movement which examined the needs and then supported a new bond issue mm -hmm. which was constructed somewhat differently than the first one. And would you describe and this as a non-partisan non issue? Oh yes, yeah. it was mm -hmm. totally non-partisan. Mm -hmm. And in fact, schools, I think, well in Cedar Rapids district for sure, and I suspect in most school districts in Iowa are non-partisan. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the types of arguments that you made to try to persuade people to support the bond? I think we I, I really don't remember okay, too right. well what the ac exact arguments were, but I know that what we tried to do was to involve as many people and as many groups and as many organizations as we, as we mm -hmm. possibly could mm -hmm. in making them knowledgeable about what the needs were. Mm -hmm. And once that was done, I think we had an overwhelming success of the bond issue. And actually, my husband was stayed very active in that citizens movement for a long time. Mm -hmm. There were similar uh, experiences all over the country. Yeah, I, I think that that story is so interesting because it seems like that is the strategy that you employed a lot as a legislator, was this coalition building approach. That's true. Um, rather than having the smoking gun argument, it was about getting people invested in an issue. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, then, after the youngest of your three children went off to prep school, you decided to re-engage um, with paid labor. And um, Well, I was okay. terribly lonesome. You know, you uh -huh. went off to school and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, what am I going to do? I'd been, I'd been so involved with the, not just being a mother, but being involved in community issues that affected my family. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, I just, I won't have anything to do. And so, mm -hmm. I decided I ought to go out and find something. I did not want to return to psychology because it had passed me by and I would, mm -hmm. it meant, would have meant going back and starting all over again with a graduate program. And I had 
frankly, <laughs> been coping with children's pr problems long enough, uh -huh. and I wanted to switch to something else. Well, and it's interesting because it, you um, got your feet wet again by um, serving on the Mayor's Commission for the Elderly in Cedar Rapids. Well, I did that. It was just a natural outgrowth, I think, of a lot of other things I had been doing. Uh -huh. I was very active in the community all through those years that I was child raising, working on everything from PTA to AAU, American Association University Women, mm -hmm. League of Women Voters, um, Mental Health Association, and uh, that kind of mm -hmm. things that were very interesting to me and were very involved with the, the life that we were living. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we had done some studying or some, at least given some attention in AUW to the co to the needs of the elderly, mm -hmm. which now you know it's hard to even imagine that. But you know there really were no uh, retirement homes. There were no suitable facilities for elderly people in need. There was very little help for seniors who had. Uh, who were poor and who had uh, transportation needs and psychological needs and medical needs and and we now have such good programs it's hard mm -hmm. to believe that none of those existed but mm -hmm. that was true so the fact that I ha was appointed by the mayor to the Commission on Elderly Housing was uh, an outgrowth logical uh -huh. right and um, one thing that our audience might be interested in is that when 380 was constructed there were homes that were in the path of that interstate yes, of course. and there were a lot of elderly people lived in those right. homes and they needed somebody to relocate these essentially, people essentially that's why the mayor had to appoint that commission mm -hmm. because as part of uh, any urban renewal project or any highway project the which is funded by federal monies, there's a requirement that there be an examination of what kind of uh, community uh, needs will be uh, exacerbated or formed by this project. And mm -hmm. then there's a requirement that they be addressed. Mm -hmm. And you applied to be the relocation director. I did. And what were you told when you applied? Well, I was told that that was a man's job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be an illegal response today, but in those uh -huh. days it was perfectly okay, for, I guess, for the manager of that department of the city to, um, to say that. And he said, why don't you apply for office manager? And I said, well, I have no skills as in office mm -hmm. <laughs> work. And, but he he visualized that as a job for a woman. Yeah, and, and just so that our audience can have some context, in 1965, the federal government passed Title VII, right. which made it illegal for people to segregate jobs based on gender, to tell women that's that this correct. is a women's only job and a men's only job. But that's exactly the response you got in 1965, and I think you're, you're, the story yes. illustrates that change doesn't it. happen <laughs> in communities immediately right. when federal legislation passes, that it takes time. That's right. And it takes people willing to challenge those practices. Yeah. Um, and then um, during the 1960s, the U.S. Supreme Court heard a couple of cases in which um, people challenged the existing structure for electing state legislators. That's correct. And they found all these studies showed that there was completely disproportionate representation, that some small um, districts had uh, one congressman, whereas a, a large district that could have three million people had one congressperson. Exactly. And so they, the Supreme Court went back to the states and told the states, no, you need to have more proportional representation. And so in uh, Iowa, for example, what happened in response to those? Well, one man, one vote was, mm -hmm. what the, was the slogan that came out of that. And in Iowa at that time, you know, we have uh, 99 counties. Mm -hmm. And essentially, every county had a uh, senator. And every county had a representative. And the larger counties had two. Mm -hmm. uh, representatives. So uh, it was not based on population. It was simply a recognition that some a county like Polk, for instance, mm -hmm. was, uh, I don't know, uh, probably had 300,000 population in those days. 
uh, needed more representation than a county like Ringgold that probably mm -hmm. had 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, But still, too, is n nowhere near <laughs> Nowhere adequate. near enough. Yeah. And so hastily, the Iowa legislature in 19, the 65 le legislature, uh, drew up a, uh, a new plan where there were, they tried to al allocate uh, representatives by county. The result was that Lynn County, where I live, Cedar Rapids, had six representatives and two senators. The uh, other counties obviously had, no one was, was denied a representative, and so we had a very large House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. It went to 165 members at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was a, an opportunity for women to run for the legislature. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in Iowa's history, we had five women elected to the legislature. Mm -hmm. We were all in the House of Representatives. There were no women in the Senate. Um, but those five, we were a source of great curiosity and uh, we got a lot of press attention because mm -hmm. it was so unusual. And when you think about that, we're talking about 1966 uh, election. We. We came into session in January of 67 with the five women. Women had had the opportunity to vote and to serve since 1919, and yet we had had at most one woman sometimes, mm -hmm. maybe two. I think there were two, a couple of uh, general assemblies. But essentially, I think there were 23 women altogether Mm -hmm. who had served in the Iowa legislature in that period from 1919 until 1965. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't a coincidence that in the 1966 general election we have an influx of women. No, and having those empty seats available right. made it possible right. for us to run. And one thing that I think is also interesting is that Prior to your service in the state, in the General Assembly, you had this interest in vulnerable populations that seemed to have followed you, you know, from the Depression to your interest in children to your interest in the elderly. And then once you got into the Iowa General Assembly, one of your interests were institutionalized juveniles. I was always very interested in, in what happened to mm -hmm. troubled children. Mm -hmm. Having worked with them as a as a professional, right. not for a long time, but mm -hmm. I had given, you know, that's really what I had majored in in college and worked in, and I was aware that we had little or no provision for care for those children. Mm -hmm. And the more I found out about it, the more disturbed I was about the, mm -hmm. the way in which we treated dependent children dependent people all together in the state of Iowa. And for our, the members of our audience who were born, you know, after the 1960s and 1970s, can you describe what you found when you would tour these facilities? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that when a child got into trouble with the law, and children always have done that, I guess, forever, uh, they were taken into custody, placed in jail. There was no place for children. Uh, we had, uh, I remember prior to my legislative service, but when I was interested in these issues, as a, we invited our so-called juvenile judge to speak to a group, and he said, well, the first thing you should know is we have no dependent children no neglected children in Lynn County. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it gives you a little feeling for what the attitudes were. The institutions, when I was first elected, I asked one of the, one of the people who had been helpful to me in my uh, campaign and who worked for the state as a, an officer, uh, a probation officer, really, and he did visit the state institutions. And I asked him if he'd take me along to see what was go what was happening. Mm 
and I found that uh, we had an institution in Davenport called the Iowa Annie Wittenmeyer Home, which was for veterans' children, had been established after the Civil War when children had been orphaned by that war. And any child who was a veteran's child who was in need was just automatically sent to that institution, even though they really, there was no reason in the world why those children should be in an institution. They should have been in foster care, but mm -hmm. the county didn't have to pay for them if they went to the Iowa Annie Wittenmeyer home, and so mm -hmm. that's where they went. So one of the first things I was interested in doing was closing that home because there were no disturbed children in it. Uh, it was really not serving them a modern purpose. It was serving a purpose that was perfectly valid in the 1860s, mm -hmm. but not in the 1960s. It was more custodial and... Well, they had a good school, they had a good program, but why would you take children into an, and put, put them in essentially an orphanage, mm -hmm. even a good orphanage, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when they didn't really need it? Mm -hmm. They weren't orphans, incidentally. Often they were just children uh, from families that for one reason or other, mm -hmm. temporarily or permanently couldn't take care of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the school at Eldora for boys was just what you would think of when you hear the distasteful word reform school. Mm -hmm. They really didn't have very good therapeutic programs. Most of those kids were disturbed kids. Uh, girls were sent to Mitchellville which is now a woman's prison. And, but at that time, the girls were taught to cook and to do fine sewing and to uh, toe the line and the discipline was extremely harsh. Of, they were girls who had gotten into some of them in trouble, but some of them had simply been run away from an impossible situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were they were given very unrealistic uh, treatment. And do you think that your training as a psychologist gave you a perspective? Oh, that, for sure. And, and what were your concerns, having that background, what were your particular concerns about their futures? Well, obviously all these girls were going to, and boys, were going to return to the community, and mm -hmm. they needed to know, first of all, they really needed a good education, and secondly, they needed to deal with their personal problems mm -hmm. so that they would be productive members of the community mm -hmm. when they, as they matured and became, and grew up. And uh, it was just a, it was an antiquated system that had not been changed in many, many years. Mm -hmm. I think initially, they probably had been very good institutions for the times in mm -hmm. which they were constructed and developed, but they needed to be modernized. Okay. One of the things that you did when you first got to the legislature was um, you made fast friends with the uh, Speaker of the House. And then later on you were appointed to the um, House Appropriations Committee. And for people who aren't very politically knowledgeable, can you explain why these two moves are advantageous for a beginning legislator? Well, I think everybody knows that who controls the purse strings pretty well controls mm -hmm. how <laughs> the life of a home or the life of a community, mm -hmm. the life of a state. So I always knew that being on the Appropriations Committee was going to be a very desirable place to be. Um, my friendship with a speaker at that time was more or less accidental. I had been introduced to him at a, a seminar that I had attended as a newly elected legislator. And he had gone around looking for people because he knew he was going to run for speaker. And I was very favorably impressed by him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spoke on his behalf to the other legislators from Lynn County. Mm -hmm and they gave him their support because of that. So naturally, he was very 
appreciative. So just to and clarify for our audience, he, it was when he was running against other people to be right. the Speaker of the House, exactly. you formed a coalition of support. Yes. And he then associated you with getting those four That's or five other votes absolutely. in his favor. And mm -hmm. so when I re requested appropriations as one of my committees, I was granted mm -hmm. that favor. Uh huh. The, this position, this appointment to right. a very powerful committee during right. your, your first term was pretty impressive. It was yeah. very nice. Yeah. Um, Although there's always an effort to give people appointments mm -hmm. to whatever committee they feel they're most interested in. Right, but I mean, I'm sure that you're vulnerable after that first election when you're unproven and to have that in your pocket to be able to go back to your constituents and say, look. Um, I don't know that constituents really appreciate <laughs> that, but it made me able to do things for my constituents that I otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Uh -huh. uh, things that the community really wanted and needed, I was able to, to get, uh -huh. even from that very first session. Uh -huh. um, one thing, just so that our audience is aware, all of these interviews are stored at the Iowa Women's Archives, which is named after Mary Louise Smith and Louise Noun, and those right. are two women who you knew personally. Very well. Um, what are your recollections of the two of them? Well, they were each uh, in each in her own way a very significant leader which in their day you know was women uh, weren't necessarily in the forefront of, of the kinds of things that they were involved in. Mary Louise was a very active person in the Republican Party. She had started in Eagle Grove where she and her husband had lived and she went on to become uh, not just a Republican a state, a national committee woman, but she was the first, I think the only woman chairman of the Republican National Committee. Mm -hmm. So she had a very distinguished political career. And Louise Noun was a very uh, intellectual, uh, very charming woman. She uh, lived in Des Moines and she was very interested in creative women and she was doing some research uh, and went to a community where a woman who was a poet had lived and discovered that this woman's papers had been just thrown away rather uh, not long before Louise had gone to find them. They had mm -hmm. been thrown in the garbage and uh, she thought what a terrible thing that is and we, sh we must establish a an Iowa Women's Archives so this doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so she went to Mary Louise. She was a prominent Democrat. She went to Mary Louise as a prominent Republican and said, let's do this. And uh, Louise Noun, of, of course, gave, she had a wonderful art collection and she gave a very uh, significant painting by Frida Kahlo, mm -hmm. Mexican woman artist who had uh, of great renown and it brought a great deal of money and that really helped establish the women's archives. Right. They also had, they asked some of their friends, including myself, to help on the committee that established the archives mm -hmm. and we, we raised money in our communities, but it was really Louise Noun's significant group uh, gift and her idea that put it into play. Well, and it seemed, it seems now looking back like such a savvy move to have um, Louise Noun, who is uh, an active Democrat, yes. and Mary Louise Smith, who is well known in Republican right. politics, come together and they were able to appeal to a wide swath of women, yes. conservative and liberal, to donate papers. And you yourself have donated your papers yes. to the Women's Archives, so if people want to do further research on your legislative career, they can they can go and look at those papers. And I would encourage people who have uh, in their possession maybe diaries or papers of women that, that the rest of us haven't heard of, people in their family, uh, to contact the Iowa Women's Archives mm -hmm. because those are the things we need to preserve. Iowa has always had women of great skills and talents and they've often been unsung. You know, when I think about it, I, I am a lawyer, and Iowa granted a law degree to a woman who was the first state in the country, and yet we were the last state to have a woman on our Supreme Court. We've still not sent a woman to Congress. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
we we were we have a lot of women <laughs> in our history that are very important, mm -hmm. and I think we should pay attention to that. Right. Um, one thing that might surprise some of our younger uh, members of our audience is that the Republican uh, agenda of the 1960s and 1970s was, in many ways, in a way that uh, took a form that I think would not be uh, that many people would not expect today. For example, some of the fiercest champions for legalizing abortion or supporting the Equal Rights Amendment were women in the GOP, were That's Republican correct. women. That was always a Republican position. And can you explain why that was? Why were those natural issues for Republicans to take up? Well, I think the Republicans have always had a commitment to indi individual freedoms, mm -hmm. and that's why civil rights individual rights, ability to choose, a recognition of all peoples, of all colors, races, religions, genders, mm -hmm. uh, is a natural for the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you once mentioned to me was, one thing that was really important to you is that, that processes be transparent. That if somebody got a promotion, it, is, it doesn't matter if a man gets a promotion over a woman, but what needs to happen is that it needs to be clear yes. why, what the, what the standards were to evaluate promotion, and that that was something that you championed. Openness in, in right. government, yes, is, has, we did a lot of, of uh, legislating on sunshine laws, open government, and uh, it gets kind of technical, administrative procedures, but the idea behind it being that we should have some way for the individual citizen to always be able to uh, understand and, if necessary, challenge the processes through which decision, government decisions mm -hmm. are made. Those decisions affect us, mm -hmm. and we give government that power over us, but we've got to see how those who are governing are using that power. And, and you helped to form an agency to help citizens navigate state bureaucracy. Can you yes, explain? Uh, what? Yes, we, we do. Uh, <laughs> the, the word escapes uh, yeah. me. But uh, we do have an advocate for, uh, the citizens uh, for advocate. anyone mm -hmm. who wants to question anything that's being done. Mm -hmm. and that is a state employee who is totally independent mm -hmm. and will work to find out whatever is, uh, what processes have gone on. And, and so just to make it clear to our audience, so uh, if in the 1950s somebody was having a problem with a state agency, uh, let's say ca <laughs> cashing in a state welfare check, for example, and, and something went wrong, it became, they were at the mercy of the people at that office to res respond to their letters or respond to their phone calls. It could be very confusing to know where to turn to if they got treated poorly by an, a state employee. Sometimes the state employees had an attitude, you know, that mm -hmm. they were there to do their work and they didn't want to be bothered by somebody asking them a question. Mm -hmm. In fact, I can remember as a legislator calling a, a state employee and asking for some information, and he said, oh, there's no point in my sending that to you. You won't understand it. Mm -hmm. And I said, just try me. <laughs> uh -huh. And he said, oh, and I said, look, <laughs> mm -hmm. I am the state legislator, and I expect to get this information. Mm -hmm. But So you can imagine what an ordinary citizen would right. get. And, in response to a question. So uh, that's why we, we in, uh, an ombudsman is the word that I was looking for. Uh -huh. We established the office of the ombudsman. And in fact, we have citizen advocates in other places for, uh, we established one in the Commerce Commission where mm -hmm. utility r rates are set and so on so that there's someone to speak as a consumer advocate. Mm -hmm. And then in 1975, you attended the first World Congress on Women in Mexico City. That was a real thrill. Yeah, what are your recollections of attending? Well, we met women from all over the world. Uh, we're really, it's very, very interesting to see what the needs are from some of the undeveloped countries and that there are women of intelligence and education and, and 
ability who are there and ready and willing and wanting to be leaders, but they have a terrible time breaking through the traditions which keep women mm -hmm. uh, really second-rate citizens. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the whole uh, political situation that we're, in, that we're experiencing today in uh, the rise of the Muslim world in part is that tension between the desire of women to be full citizens and the uh, traditions where men keep them from assuming those mm -hmm. uh, responsible roles. I think that, you know, people are the same everywhere. The people who have power part with it very reluctantly. Right. The people who don't have it would like to have an opportunity to, to exert it. Uh -huh. But certainly everybody wants to be uh, able to develop their own talents to the fullest. Right. And then when you were in the state legislature, there were a couple of issues at the University of Iowa that you became engaged in. And one of the issues was that um, the university tried to dismantle a couple of programs, dental hygiene and social work. Yes. What do you recall being the major issues with those plans? <laughs> well, as always, the university is always being pressured by the, uh, the regents and the legislature and the public in general to to save money and to be more efficient. And in those days, they set up a study committee to see whether all the programs were necessary. And the two programs they came up with as candidates for elimination were two programs that were almost entirely uh, pop have women as their students. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I happened to be serving on a committee uh, on this, for this uh, Department of Social Work to, uh, and we were exploring the need for a doctoral program within that. Mm -hmm. We now have it, but at that time there was no doctoral program in the state. And there were many jobs that required a doctoral, a, a doctorate and uh, hospital programs and uh, agency programs and so on. And so we were working toward getting that uh, expanding that, pro that <laughs> uh, social work school to include uh, that graduate program. And it, they suggested abolishing the, the school. So I went to the president, then president of the university and told him that we were very disturbed by that and we would not uh, hesitate to take, to take legal action to mm -hmm. uh, protect women's rights. Mm -hmm. and the uh, school's rights to exist. Mm -hmm. And indeed, um, you, were right down. <laughs> yeah, you were successful at preserving yes. social work, but eventually dental hygiene was let go. They did, they did turn, they did abolish the dental hygiene. And it hygiene ended up program. being a, it diminished their professional autonomy in the sense that now it's a two-year degree, whereas before it was a four-year degree. I'm not familiar okay. with it, but I know that they were very unhappy about it, yeah. but they were not successful in fighting it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that it's now something that community colleges right. uh, mm -hmm. have jurisdiction over. Mm -hmm. And then um, one thing that has been interesting about you is that in your late 50s, you went back to law school after, <laughs> after having had a career first as a psychologist and then as a legislator. Yes. And then what prompted you to apply to law school? Well, when I was in the legislature, I lived with a legislator from Davenport, uh, another one of, the, of those five women, and we, uh, we became very close friends. And I re realized that, and we still are close friends, incidentally, and I realized that she saw things a little differently, and she, had, she was a lawyer. And so I thought, when I was, I thought it was time to leave the legislature, and I thought it would be interesting to uh, get a law degree, and mm -hmm. I, there was something there that I wanted, was fascinated by. But for a little while, there was an overlap. You were running for right. the state legislature <laughs> while taking law yes, school Yes, I didn't know whether I'd like going back to school uh -huh. or not. I hadn't been in school for 35 years, uh -huh. <laughs> and so, uh, I didn't, I, I ran for re-election and at the same time I entered law school. Uh-huh. And what type of law did you practice? You eventually then retired from the state legislature I in did. 1980. Yeah. 
Yes. And then uh, you graduated from the University of Iowa Law School. In, was it in 81? 80. 80. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also 1980. And then what type of law did you practice? Well, I practiced uh, administrative law and general law. I okay. Didn't, but especially administrative law because I had been involved in the adoption of the Iowa Administrative uh, Procedures Act. And so mm -hmm. I, I had a leg up on my fellow lawyers and understanding that act. And for our audience who may not know a thing about law, um, <laughs> what, is what, do, what, do, what do administrative lawyers do and why are they important for? Well, administrative mm -hmm. law essentially deals with the government. Mm -hmm. And anybody, everybody knows that knowing how to deal with the government is essential to living these days. We mm -hmm. used to talk about regulated and unregulated, you know, regulated industries, but Essentially, everything is regulated today. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything you can do that doesn't fall within the jurisdiction of some uh, legal restrictions at the state, federal, or local levels. Mm -hmm. So that's what administrative law is all about. And I would imagine that for historically vulnerable populations, not having the knowledge or access to knowledge about policies and knowledge about laws really does put people at a disadvantage. And so to oh, yes. have an, somebody who is an advocate is it's essential. It's actually true for everybody, yeah. not just disadvantaged yeah. populations. And uh, I think it's become, as I say, regulations, government has, has really, is constantly extending itself. Mm -hmm. And more recently, you've taken on very interesting work uh, with plants. Can you describe what you do now? <laughs> well, I'm just a, <laughs> just a lowly volunteer, but I am working in Florida with the Selby Botanical Gardens in their research department. They are assembling an herbarium. It's a, they have a certain kinds of plants in which they specialize, and they're trying to develop a... Uh, an herbarium, which is an, an herbarium, essentially is forming a library of of uh, plants, not just writing about them, but preserving the plants themselves. And they're preserved two ways: one is in a liquid, and one is in dried form. And mm -hmm. I work with the dried form, and we they have to be mounted in a certain way and identified in a certain way. And this will be very important to research uh, over the the years, the largest herbarium in the world is in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, in France. Ours is a new one and uh, our little group is very proud because we started at zero and we have passed the 100,000 mark. Wow. We had a little celebration this uh, uh -huh. winter uh, when we did that. So. It's, a, it's very interesting. Yeah, I find the diversity of your intellectual interests so fascinating. <laughs> um, one question that we ask of all of our guests is to recommend a book uh, to our audience. Is there a book that you would? Well, I've recently finished reading Cutting for Stone. Okay. And I would highly recommend that book to anybody. It, uh, it's very well written. Uh, the author is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Program. He is also a physician of some prominence, I understand, uh, who teaches and uh, practices at Stanford in Palo Alto, California, but also is the head of a program on medicine and ethics that he established in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. So all of these interests of his are expressed in this book, but it also has a lot to say about, brings up a lot of issues that are current among, and um, I would recommend it highly. Okay. It's readable, mm -hmm. it's thought provoking. Okay, and, and finally, what do you wish that um, our audience might take away about um, issues of aging and being elderly in society? What do you think people don't understand about being elderly that you wish that more people would recognize? I suppose, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. I suppose the thing is that you know you're you don't feel any different inside. Mm -hmm. You may look old, the hair is white, and there are lots of wrinkles, and, but you're still yourself. Your personality, maybe you get a little wisdom and you certainly slow down in every way, mm -hmm. but your feelings are the same, your interests are the same, your ambitions, mm 
maybe they're dulled a little bit. Maybe you're a little more realistic about what you're going to achieve. But if you stay, if you're alive, you ought to just keep uh, staying interested in all the things that are around you. And of course, mm -hmm. you have the pleasure of children and grandchildren, and now I have a great grandchild, yeah. and that keeps one uh, uh -huh. always ready for more. I think most people look at some old person having trouble moving slow, get a little impatient with them. But remember, those are just real people with a lot to give. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I know that I probably speak on behalf of a lot of people watching and that uh, your interest in people and your compassion for people is, is quite remarkable in the way that that shaped your many careers that you've held throughout your lifetime. So we're really grateful to you for participating in this episode of Women at Iowa. Well, thank you for asking me, Carissa. Yes, well, thank you. And once again, this has been another episode of Women at Iowa. Thank you for joining us.